You like Geithner, I like Geithner, everybody likes Geithner for president. Hang up the banner, beat the drum, we'll make Geithner Washington. Hi, I'm Tim Cavanaugh for Reason TV. We're here with Jim Newton, editor at large at the LA Times opinion section and author of the new book, Eisenhower, The White House Years. Jim, thanks for joining us. Pleasure. We're old colleagues, so it's uh, good to catch up with an old LA yes. Times hand. Nice to see you. <laughs> and there was a, a biography a couple years ago by Michael Corda of Eisenhower's War Years, and this sort of picks up the thread to some extent of covering just the presidency, which is, as I think you make a pretty good case in the book, really underrated. I hope that comes through in the book. I mean, I do think it's a period of enormous change in the United States and really effective presidency, somewhat to my surprise. I had done a previous book on Chief Justice Earl Warren, who was not a fan of Eisenhower after he'd been appointed. And so I came to this book with some skepticism about how I would come off and came away uh, mightily impressed by him. I for president, I for president, I for president, I for president. You like Ike, I like Ike, everybody likes Ike for president. How much did Ike uh, work at that underestimation? It's not in the book, but there's an old fable about Ike that at some point he told an aide, well, if I get into trouble, I'll just perplex them with my syntax. Uh -huh, right, There's a, I'll confuse them. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, yeah, I think part of it is quite deliberate. There is, as you say, a sort of sense of lowering expectations for himself. Also, his golfing, his vacationing, obviously something he enjoyed and was important for his health, particularly after his heart attack. But he also really saw it as a, he took it on himself quite self-consciously to try to lower the sense of crisis in the country that he felt FDR and Truman had perpetuated and that he was going to sort of calm the country down. That's one thing I always appreciated about Ike is, you know, he spent basically his entire adult life in taxpayer-funded institutions <laughs> of one kind or another, and yet was always very skeptical of calls to sacrifice for the greater good. The best example, I think, is in Sputnik. The establishment media went sort of crazy after Sputnik, mm -hmm. saying how, you know, we had to retool the education system. Walter Littman had a great thing in the LA Times about this is what comes of doing nothing but looking at better consumer goods. Basically the same argument that Khrushchev made to Nixon. <laughs> right. And yet Ike was very much about, you know, we, we shouldn't be panicking over Sputnik. We don't want to kind of make all these big changes. Well, one of the things that people forget, uh, Ike had the benefit of the U2 program uh, when Sputnik went off. So he knew, uh, knew better than the American people did uh, the capacities that the Soviet Union had and its lack of capacity. Uh, they were really uh, quite un, uh, unperturbed by the whole thing. It's only once the American people got kind of whipped up and nervous about it that the administration felt an obligation to react. What's, what's about the role of Ike's brothers? You, it's yeah. an interesting, I didn't even know Ike had any brothers and it was, it was very interesting to see their correspondence with you know, him. Ike talked a lot about the middle way um, as, as the sort of style and approach of his presidency. And I think it's easy to see that being a sort of outgrowth of his family. He was the third of six brothers. They grew up in a house smaller than the office that he had when he worked in the Pentagon. So, you know, it's a rough and tumble family. And then within those brothers, uh, among his older brothers, Edgar, was quite conservative. And among his younger brothers, Milton, uh, was quite liberal. And if you look at the correspondence between Ike and Edgar and Milton, you often see him being sort of tugged in two directions by Edgar and Milton, almost always ending up with Milton, by the way. He has a much more uh, contentious uh, correspondence with his brother, Edgar. You present Ike as unexpectedly progressive character. Certainly by today's standards, Ike would represent a quite liberal uh, segment of the Republican Party. But you know, when he had opposition, when he had to fight for things in Congress, he just as often had to fight the right wing of his own party as liberals. McCarthy was a consistent pain for him, at least in the first couple of years. Later, Bill Noland and the China First folks really were a troublesome part of the party for him to deal with in, in foreign affairs, particularly in Taiwan and China. The highway system is a good example, I think, of him really not being bound to a kind of Republican orthodoxy. On the other side, civil rights, Ike found it difficult to find a sort of progressive course in civil rights. I don't think he really felt it in his heart. He ended up having quite a good record on civil rights, but in some ways despite himself. Where do you stand on the, the idea that the, the 50s were where the real movement happened in civil rights, not the 60s? Yeah, I think that's accurate in terms of, I mean, obviously there were movements across both decades, uh, but, you know, Brown versus Board of Education, obviously, is 54. You know, the, uh, the Montgomery bus boycott, the rise of Martin Luther King, all of that, for the most part, is in the 1950s. And Ike's contribution to that uh, was indirect but profound. He appointed Earl Warren, he appointed William Brennan, both to the Supreme Court. And of course, the, his big, most you know, memorable contribution is in 1957, 
uh, in the Little Rock crisis. Since the subtext was civil rights, it had the effect of, of him being a champion of civil rights. Ike as a TV president, how much do you think of him as a sort of modern image-based president? Well, it is, it's the first uh, presidency to run with a jingle. You like Ike, I like Ike, everybody likes Ike for president. A modern TV sense, uh, the, the, of course, the growth of television throughout the 1950s is, is explosive. He is the first president to really work with the medium. He worked with an advertising agency uh, in 52 and again in 56 to make the most out of his image. He didn't have the television presence, obviously, that Kennedy did. But he understood uh, its, uh, its potential and I think is the first to really take advantage of it in that sense. Ike and federal spending, with the caveat that he passed the highway bill and built, you know, started the interstate highway system, or started to connect it. Mm -hmm. At another uh, later point in his presidency, there was a stimulus on the table that would have been f uh, just for infrastructure, which he opposed because he didn't think the states were ready for it. Yeah. That's a pretty interesting lesson for the 2009 uh, ARA stimulus, which, you know, as we can now see, a lot of the states just ended up using those infrastructure funds to pay for general fund expenses right. or otherwise move funds around and, and so that actually not much highway got built or anything like that. Do we see a bright line for a president? Two things to think about with respect to Eisenhower, I think, in the kind of modern economic context are one, as I said earlier, I, I don't think he was ever locked to a kind of uh, ideological position in the sense that it would cause him to refuse to engage in stimulus. He was willing to build highways. He was willing to build the St. Saint, Saint Lawrence Seaway. But he also believed very strongly in balanced budgets. He inherited uh, a significant uh, deficit from Harry Truman. He left the country with a surplus. He believed in balanced budgets, not just for the sake of balanced budgets, but for the money that he felt that it would uh, liberate if the economy were on sound footing to pay for spending, including military spending. He believed very strongly in mutual aid and support for American allies. And he believed that we were engaged in a very expensive uh, Cold War with the Soviet Union and China. And deficit spending, to his mind, uh, robbed the country of the money it needed to spend on those priorities. So he was not, he was not a liberal. He was not a tax and spend liberal by any means. I think he was uh, less bound, though, ideologically than either side is today in the, in the conversation about the economy. The good case for Eisenhower now, prior to your book, has always been the military-industrial complex speech. And how much of that should we credit him for? What is so striking about the farewell address, in which he talks about the military-industrial complex, is he assigns it to this sort of ominous, quasi-governmental entity that no one had really thought of. And he calls it a complex, which gives it a special kind right. of a, you know, a yeah. portent. I think that the, the fears that he was expressing, the concern about the warping of American policy to serve a military need, was there throughout. I think he put it in particularly vivid terms, and it was particularly memorable because he said it as a farewell. I think they're, they're, these parting words of this great general president uh, are so unexpected, I think, for so many people that they really resonate. An interesting point uh, about Ike's post-presidency, and we're not finished because I wanted to, there's something I wanted to go back mm -hmm. to, but when President Kennedy was assassinated, was saddened and yet was a little bit put off by the kind of mawkish mourning. We're just yeah. coming off the 10-year anniversary of 9-11, and that's an interesting trait. Yeah, I don't, uh, I want to be careful to characterize that correctly. That observation comes mostly from his son, John Eisenhower, who was very helpful to me in the final stages of this book in particular. Uh, and John wanted to be sure not to make it sound as though his father were uncaring. He cared about the loss of the Kennedy for his children and whatnot. But uh, Dwight Eisenhower had been a general. He had uh, sent many men uh, to their deaths. He understood sacrifice for the country in a kind of basic way. I think he was uh, a little taken aback uh, by the national kind of convulsion over Kennedy's death, which is not, again, to, to take away from real sadness about it, but I think he was surprised at how seized up the country was about it. Yeah. Uh, speaking of sending people to their deaths, that uh, certainly happened when he was president. We have the interventions in Iran and Guatemala. There's two ways to look at the Eisenhower uh, record, I think, the war record. One, uh, in terms of American combat, uh, Eisenhower inherited the Korean War, ended it within seven months, or brought it to an armistice anyway. Uh, from that point forward, the entire uh, sum total of combat casualties for the U.S. and, and the Eisenhower years is one soldier who was killed by a sniper in Lebanon uh, during the invasion there. The rest is through covert operations. Uh, and the Eisenhower strategy for containing the Soviet Union was really twofold, which was to keep the Soviet Union uh, within its borders by the threat of nuclear deterrence and to roll it back through the use of covert action. And he did so quite enthusiastically in Iran and Guatemala. And then, of course, there's Indonesia and there's other places around the world where he's using covert action, sometimes successfully, sometimes unsuccessfully, but in a deliberate and uh, attempt to keep the Soviet Union uh, on the defensive. Nixon comes off surprisingly well and, and you know, certainly 
certainly sympathetic in this book and actually honorable in some ways that you wouldn't have expected. Yeah, and Ike had a good, mostly good, but somewhat complicated uh, relationship. Not, never one of equals. Even through his presidency, Ike uh, tried to move him off the ticket for the 1956 campaign. Uh, thought that Nixon would benefit by running a major department, Department of Defense, uh, he suggested to him. And I think part of that is a paternalism. He thought that Nixon was so political that uh, actually running something would be good for his development. And there's, a, as you can tell, a kind of paternalism about that. Uh, Nixon resisted uh, understanding correctly as a politician that that would be seen as a demotion and that it would hurt him. On the other hand, uh, Ike enthusiastically backed uh, Nixon in 1960, was sort of frustrated that Nixon wouldn't use him more in the campaign, and was bitterly disappointed uh, that Nixon lost to Kennedy, saw it as a real repudiation of himself, an election not unlike, I would say, the election uh, of Barack Obama. The ways that Obama ran against the Bush record, uh, Kennedy sort of did against the Eisenhower record, and so Ike took it quite personally. And lived just long enough to see Nixon elected president, which he also was enthusiastic about. And of course, his uh, grandson married Nixon's daughter, so the families now are quite intertwined as well. Well, it's great talking to you. Likewise, Tim. Nice to see you. Mm -hmm.